So I just press space, or do I have to have the thing on the... Oh, no, it's okay, just space. Hi, Professor, my question is, is it aluminum or aluminum? Because I want to know what to call my aluminum model. <laughs> Hi, it's a great model, and you should call it aluminium. Aluminum used to be the American name, but a few years ago, I can't remember, 10, 15, perhaps 20 years ago, there was an agreement that the Americans would call aluminum aluminium, and the Europeans would change the names of some of their elements. How many periodic tables do you own? How many periodic table ties do you have? Um, I have no idea how many periodic tables I own. I've got two cups with periodic tables and in my office I've got lots and lots of periodic tables. Fridge magnets, mouse mats, um, umbrella. As regards ties, um, I suppose I've got about six or seven. But on several occasions I've been at a conference or somewhere like that and somebody's admired my tie and I've just taken it off and given to them. So I've owned a lot more ties than I've got now. Where did most of the elements' names come from? I think the names of elements came from all sorts of places. There's some names which are really old. Elements like gold were known from prehistoric times. And so the names for gold are very different in different languages. It's so or in, in, in French and gold in English and um, Zolota in Russian. So they all sound quite different because each tribe or nation had its own name. And then in more recent times, it, there was a whole clutch of elements that were invent discovered in the 18th, 19th century, early 19th century, where again different countries had very different names. Nitrogen is called nitrogen in English, Stickstoff in German, and is called azote in, in French. So they're very different names. But then the more recent elements that have been discovered are named by the person who discovers them and sometimes for quite um, random reasons. Sometimes they were discovered in the place like Darmstadtium or Dubnium. Sometimes because people were really um, proud of a scientist like Borium or Einsteinium. And sometimes, like the most recent one, Copernicum, that was named after Copernicus, I think just because the discoverers wanted to celebrate science. And this year is the year of astronomy. Uh, what do you think will be the names for elements 112 through 116 and 118? Do you think they're ever going to make an element named after you? Well, I tried to guess the name of element 112, Plancum, and I completely got it wrong. It was Copernicium, though I'm still going for Copernicum as being easier to say. I have no idea what the other names will be because people name elements after scientists who've inspired them. And how do I know what is going on in the heads of those people who discover them? And it's not just one because nowadays these r very heavy elements are named by or discovered by a huge team. So you don't know which of them is going to think of the name. And I don't know, I'm sure nobody's going to name an element after me and I'm particularly keen that they shouldn't because I have to be dead for 20 years before they can do it and I don't want to be dead yet. <laughs> um, what's the hardest element for you to say? Why are you asking him that? Because I can't say mag ma manganese, manganese. <laughs> <laughs> I think the hardest element to say is number 111 which is Röntgenium which may be fine in German, but I find it difficult to say in English. And some of the element names are quite difficult to say in, um, in English when you're in front of a class and as a teacher or a professor you're a bit nervous. I had a chemistry teacher who said elephants instead of elements in one of his classes.
and he could never control the class after that. What first got you interested in science? I'm not quite sure why I got interested in science. My first school, where I was until the age of 13, they didn't teach science at all. You weren't allowed to do it. So I suppose that was quite exciting that it, was, it wasn't forbidden, but nobody taught you. And so I used to read books about science. And um, I have um, a... Um, well, I used to have a chain. I now got a chain like this, but I used to have a smaller one. And I did experiments when I was meant to be doing my homework. It was a boarding school. You lived there. And so we had supervised homework sessions. And I was doing experiments with pendulums, trying to measure how quickly they did. And with a stopwatch, I borrowed a stopwatch from somebody so I could measure it was one second and so on. And the teacher came up and was very angry and said, why aren't you doing your work? And I had to tell him I was doing science. And I really liked physics, but I found the maths a bit hard. But when I was young, I had a very good memory and I was fascinated by chemistry and I could remember all sorts of facts. And I really loved the colours and what happened in the reactions. So I suppose I really fell in love with chemistry when I was a teenager, 14, 15, 16, and I'm still in love. Tell me about this chain. Tell me about that you and, you and chains, because people probably don't know anything about this. What's well, um, you, I always fiddle with my hands when I speak. I talk, uh, wave my hands, and a lot of the time I just play with things. And when I was a teenager, I broke the chain on my parents' bath. And I, so I went to a shop and bought another one. And then I, when I got home, I discovered I could repair the original chain. So I kept the one I bought just as a toy. And I have, um, ever since, this is actually the third one I've had since I was a teenager. And I just keep it in my pocket and play with it. I sometimes use it for lecture demonstrations, sort of spinning it round and demonstrating angular momentum which is one of the things I have to teach our first-year students. But you can't take these things on planes because they think it might be a weapon. So I have a plastic chain which I take on aeroplanes. <laughs>